From the headquarters of Telesio English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I'm Sweeney Gray. Demonstrations continue in Buenos Aires as protesters take to the streets to show their disapproval of President Mauricio Macri's government and the G20's presence in Argentina. The city is going into lockdown, but a counter-summit organized by social organizations against anti-austerity policies is taking place despite the massive deployment of security forces. These imperialistic capitalist sectors from our country bring nothing other than laziness and hunger. They don't offer anything concrete, they don't resolve environmental issues, they resolve absolutely nothing. The only thing they are doing in our Americas is taking our natural resources. And other protests have also taken place in Argentina against the verdict on the rape and murder of 16-year-old Lucia Perez. A criminal court on Monday ruled that there was not enough evidence to charge the three men accused, which sparked outrage. Videos of the protests were shared via social media under the hashtag Ni Uno Menos, which means not one less in Spanish. Now to Mexico, where overcrowding in makeshift camps in the border city of Tijuana has sparked fears of a health crisis among migrants and medical teams. Thousands of migrants are using portable toilets set up just meters away from where they access water and children play. To reduce the risk of an outbreak, doctors are offering vaccinations and are treating sick migrants. Bad, very bad. Are you worried? Very, because with children, it is horrible, it's very dirty. That's why we try to keep it clean out here. Epidemics happen in conditions such as this. Our job here is to stop this from happening. We have a vaccination program. We are doing this now and yesterday, and today we started vaccinating against chickenpox, even though it's not serious. We are still going to vaccinate all children here in the shelter. Faced with what could be weeks or months before making entry into the United States, migrants are faced with the decision of whether to try to stay and work in Mexico or to head home, particularly with worsening conditions and the aggression from U.S. border agents last weekend. An officer stood in the middle of the street looking like Rambo, and boom, he launched a big gas bomb right in the middle of us and sent people running. It's a shame to go, but I love my family a lot more than being here now. I'm very sick now as a result of it, and I can't continue. They fired the gas bomb at us, and everyone were running. Kids and women were fainting. We've never seen anything like that Many of like us are sick with asthma, and you can sleep well. Food is scarce, and instead of us sending money to our families, they are sending money to us in order to eat, which is unfair. So I'm not going to risk my life to get somewhere where I have no one, when getting there is so dangerous, so I'd rather go home. The Ecuadorian Vice President Marina, Maria Alejandro Vicuña has denied allegations that she received improper financial contributions when she was a legislator. Ecuadorian Vice President Maria Alejandra Vicuña has been accused of embezzlement by one of her former advisors, Ángel Sagbay, who has stated that Vicuña took bribes for political favors. Around $20,000 were deposited by Sagbay directly into the Vice President's bank account, who in a press conference rejected the accusations completely. The Secretary of Communication has reiterated the government's position and clarified that the President has not met personally with Vicuña, having only communicated with her via cell phone. Our work over the past 18 months has been to make any process independent and respectful. If there are any accusations against the Vice President, the appropriate institutions must handle it. Constitutional experts explained that the Constitution allows the President and Vice President of the country to be prosecuted for the crimes of bribery and illicit enrichment, concluding that this will be possible in the case of Vicuña. Once the prosecutor's office gathers all relevant evidence to present to the judges, they must then get approval from Congress so that a criminal case can begin. After that, the vice president would be officially accused of embezzlement, 
and her immunity removed. Some sectors are already talking about a politicized judgment. The National Assembly will not care if the crime was committed or not, just that there's an accusation. The court must decide whether there is enough proof and whether the Assembly ought to allow the trial. Analysts have also suggested that the intention of the government is to stay in line with banking interests and maintain its distance from the policies of the previous administration. Moreno has marked the defense of the... President Moreno has left the vice president to stand on her own. His administration is built around political persecution and bringing back neoliberalism. Any other president would try and defend the vice president. He says he will let the judiciary be her defense. The vice president has further announced that she has evidence to present to the prosecutor's office. According to her, Sagbay is being financed by those who want to generate political chaos in the country. Denise Herrera, Telesur, Ecuador. The Ecuadorian Ombudsman's Office has spoken out about the situation of the former Vice President Jorge Glass. In light of Glass's ill health, they have urged the judiciary to decide on its position with regard to his medical attention. Glass has been on a hunger strike for over a month to bring attention to the inhumane conditions he's being held in, as well as what many call his political persecution. And the Bolivian president, Evo Morales, has urged Ecuador to take better care of Jorge Glass. On Twitter, Morales said that political differences should be left behind when there is a life at risk. And we're staying with news from the Bolivian president. He has registered as a presidential candidate in the country's next election. Morales went to Bolivia's electoral body along with dozens of his supporters. He's seeking to rule the country until 2025. He says he wants to continue the socialist programs that, has redu that have reduced the country's poverty rates. Brothers and sisters, we are here to register our participation in the primary elections. We are convinced that with our supporters, for a Bolivia that is changing through its democratic and cultural revolution, that on January 27th of the following year, the people will decide this. A defeat for the right wing is almost certain. Time now for a short break. More news after this. Enjoy our programming from Monday to Friday, where you'll find the best information on culture, innovation, conservation, human well-being. Keep up to date on the latest innovations in science and technology with Atomun. The habits and knowledge you need to live a healthy lifestyle are on Guide Your Body. Environmental consciousness is required to preserve our Earth. Undergo your transformation on Green Zone. All about equity, diversity, and respect for identities on By Gender. Cultural manifestations, the art in all its forms and the stories of real lives. Every day we feature a wide variety of content only on Telesur, the news source from Latin America and the Caribbean. Welcome back. The Brazilian president-elect, Jair Bolsonaro, has met with U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton in Rio de Janeiro. This is the first high-level meeting between U.S. and the Brazilian leader. The two representatives hope to strengthen economic and security ties, among others. Bolton said, Bolton said he is preparing the ground for a meeting between Bolsonaro and U.S. President Donald Trump. 
Brazil will not be hosting the COP25 UN conference next year due to reported financial limitation. The announcement comes just ahead of the start of this year's COP24 annual climate conference in Poland. President-elect Jair Bolsonaro has vowed to pull Brazil from the Paris Climate Accord. He has also promised to remove restrictions on, agri on the agribusiness sector, which is responsible for environmental damage in the Amazon rainforest. This is a transition from our government to another government which does not keep the same commitment, whether with the global climate agenda or with the local agenda of public policies which would bring Brazil to reduce its emissions to reduce deforestation. Peruvian citizens and organizations have held protests in Lima against corruption. Holding banners and flags, they took to the streets of the capital to demand the closure of the Congress due to multiple corruption charges. Protesters said that the former president, Alan Garcia, shouldn't be granted asylum in Uruguay. They say he must be brought to justice and be made to face the full legal consequences of his alleged involvement in corruption and money laundering linked to Odebrecht. This mobilization is demanding that all the corrupt go, and the corrupt, where are they? Not only in the judiciary, also mainly in Congress, in the Congress controlled by the Fujimorismo and by Aprismo. We demand that all of them leave. And heavy rain continues to fall across Peru, causing a river to burst its banks and lots of mudslides. Local residents attempted to cross a highway made impassable. School children were also amongst those directly affected, still hoping to get to class despite the adverse conditions. Moving on to Chile, public sector workers have been protesting to demand the government improve their working conditions. On Tuesday, they held demonstrations outside the presidential palace. They wanted to enter Constitution Square, but security forces cordoned off the area. This is bad because repression still exists in Chile. The dispute between the current government and the public sector broke out over salary negotiations, which they usually hold at the end of each year. Every year the government, but especially the current right-wing administration, doesn't improve the rights of public sector workers. In fact, they increasingly curb our rights and salaries. Public sector workers asked for a 7% salary increase, but the government has decided to freeze it at 3.1%. It is an embarrassment that the government is trying to give us a raise of 3.1% instead of 7%. These demonstrations represent the feeling of over 350,000 workers across the country, but their concerns appear to not matter to President Sebastián Piñera, who was hosting his Peruvian counterpart inside the palace. When workers have bigger incomes, the economy improves as well. So when the government of President Sebastián Piñera only gives pennies to workers, they don't only harm them, but in fact the whole country. The situation doesn't look good for workers. November 30th is the deadline for any salary negotiations. If they don't manage to reach an agreement, then there won't be any salary increases for 2019. And what's worse, it is also the last day to renew work contracts, which is why many people fear there will be massive layoffs. And Sebastian Pinera's government and public sector workers have reached an agreement after protests and negotiations on wage adjustment. Our correspondent, Tiare Valenzuela, has the details. This was day a negotiation was carried out between the public sector and the government. Workers demand better working conditions, just stability and a wage adjustment. After three days of paralysis, workers finally managed to convince the government, obtaining a salary increase of 3.5% despite the 7% initially demanded by the sector. This negotiation comes to an end after the pressure exercised during three days in which hospital ministries and police service have been paralyzed. This agreement was signed by the vast majority of the unions, except for two of them that will consolidate their members. Now, Chile has created a gender identity policy that will give trans minors the ability to change their gender on their official documents. President Sebastian Pinera has signed a law that will allow trans minors from as, yo as young as 14 years old to change their gender. The law also states that it isn't necessary for the trans person to have transitioned physically to have their gender changed. 
Thousands of students in Colombia have marched to demand a real budget for public universities from Ivan Duque's government. Students are protesting despite the government's warnings. Teachers and indigenous communities also joined the demonstration to reject the policies of the government, which they say are against human rights. We as students totally oppose the violent attacks by these state's repressive forces. We raise the people's voice to fight for our rights. These forces are violating our legitimate right, which is the popular organization, and march to express themselves. We head to Cuba, which is building a new high-tech industrial park aimed at covering high technology, electronics, and the consumer industry. The Vice President, Ramiro Valdez Menendez, attended the construction weeks that have just started by the Vietnamese company, um, Velocera. The industrial park will cover the needs of the internal market and also produce tools for exports. This project is another evidence of the strategy nature of bilateral relations as it was ratified by the top leaders of both countries in the recent visit to Vietnam by the President Miguel Díaz-Canel and the potential to expand economic and trade links. Democrats in the U.S. have nominated, ha, nominated Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House of Representatives as they prepare to take over control of the House for the first time in over eight years. Meanwhile, Republicans are expected to vote against Pelosi, who previously had held the same position between 2007 and 2011. Pelosi has also promised to hold investigations into the Trump administration's activities following two years of inertia by Republicans. We are invigorated by new members coming in and new thinking of our members. So this was no different than any ever before. It is different in that we have an historic, historic uh, freshman class by dint of their experience, their diversity, uh, their gender. It's, it's something very, very special. And let us just take a moment to dwell on the fact that we are in the majority. Majority, majority, majority. And the United States Senate has voted on a resolution to end the support of the U.S. military for the Saudi-led coalition's military offensive on Yemen. The resolution was passed by a vote of 63 to 37. This has reflected bipartisan anger at President Trump's response to the humanitarian crises in Yemen and the murder of the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. U.S. intervention in Yemen is unauthorized, unconstitutional, and immoral and we must not we cannot delay voting to end our involvement and our support of Saudi Arabia any further if we do we have ourselves to blame for our country's lost credibility on the world stage and more importantly our own consciences will bear the blame for the thousands of lives that will surely continue to be lost we'll take a short break now more news after this Somos esa ventana que se abre para visibilizarlos entre fronteras. Thursday, only on Dallas World. An occasion to enjoy the cultural diversity that defines our South American essence. Come along to find out the story behind these personalities, traditions, and artistic expressions that unite us as a whole. Real Lives, Friday, only on Telesur.
Welcome back. Thousands of farmers from across India are in New Delhi, demanding debt relief and renumer remunerative prices for their produce. The farmers will be headed to, headed to the parliament to call for a special session to discuss the crisis in the agrarian sector. Hundreds of organizations are supporting today's march, which is said to be one of the largest congregations of Indian farmers in its recent times. We will only stop if every farmer is provided with 1.5% increased amount of his total payment for his hard work, his family's effort on the land, cattle and tractor related work. They include the cost of diesel and fertilizers. Otherwise, this is just deception. Currently, the maximum selling price is at minimum. We want it to be optimized so that the farmers can lead a respectful life. If the farmers' loans are not waived off, then the maximum selling price would not be of any use because then that amount will be completely utilized on repaying the loans. Therefore, we want complete loan waiver. Turkey's capital has named a street in honor of the legendary U.S. human rights activist Malcolm X. Ankara city workers changed street signs on Thursday morning. Now, this is the same street where the new U.S. Embassy is currently being built. Malcolm X advocated for the rights of black people in the U.S. while inciting white liberals in the harshest of terms and shattering the conservative rules of U.S. politics in the 1960s. As a person from Ankara, I was pleased to hear that such a name was given to a street of Tsukura Ambar district. I can express my joy. I know who Malcolm X is. He is an American politician who was black and Muslim. I'm glad the street gets the name. But I want to say, not only the name of Malcolm X, but all the heroes' names should be given to the streets in Turkey and in the world. Nigeria's president has urged soldiers not to give up the fight against armed jihadists Boko Haram on a visit to the key city of Maduguri. Despite heavy losses, Muhammad Buhari paid tribute to the army who he says have helped to secure the area. His visit came a day before he holds talks with his regional allies on how to counter Boko Haram. Now, there's been an increase in attacks on the military and civilians, leading to fears of a resurgence. The bottom line is we have personal security. You are only secure physically and materially as long as this country is secure. If for any reason this country is made insecure, you are the first to lose your security. The railway connecting the port of Point Nyore with Brazzaville in Congo has resumed service two years after it was forced to close. The service was disrupted after fighting between state forces and rebels in the Pool region. The reopening coincided with the Republic's 58th anniversary of independence from the Democratic Republic of Congo. It was very hard. This recovery for us can only bring joy, especially since we have spent two years of technical unemployment. Ruling party candidate Salom Zurabishvili has won the presidential election in Georgia, according to preliminary results announced by the Central Election Commission. With 54 out of 57 polling stations counted, Zurabishvili received almost 60% of the vote and her opposition rival received 40.46% in the second round of voting. With that, she will become the first woman president. The second round was under close scrutiny by opposition and international observers due to complaints of irregularities. The preliminary results of the second tour of presidential elections in Georgia are such. Candidate number five, Grigol Vasadze, has collected 779,000 votes, which is 40.46% of total votes. Candidate number 48, Salome Zurabishili, has collected 1,147,000, that is 59.54% of total votes. Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko says his country is ready for a possible confrontation with Russia. Tensions continue between the two continue after Ukrainian military ships entered Russian maritime space. Similarly, the U.S. Secretary of Defense James Mattis has accused Russia of attempting to annex the Kush Strait. On his part, Russian President Vladimir Putin says his country won't fall to provocations. 
It is a sign of the planned provocation to take advantage of the situation and introduce martial law in the country. There is nothing in common with efforts to try to fix Russia-Ukraine relations. It's a game for climb. It's a dirty game inside the country to suppress its political enemies. Today is the International Day of Solidarity with Palestine. And also Palestinian political prisoners Ahmed Zatari, who is 16, and Shadi Farah, who is 15, were released today after spending three years in prison for crimes they did not commit. They were treated to a hero's welcome at the Kalandia checkpoint. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at talisierenglish.net. Also join us on social media. We are very active on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Sweeney Gray. Thank you for watching.